Welcome back to the second video of this series. So in this video, we're gonna go over the main UI elements needed to create the remote for this room that I'm sitting in. Now, most of our commands are going to be utilize the TV remote commands, which we'll be sending over IR. We'll also need to send some receiver commands because that's what I'm using for volume control. And really, the benefit of the home remote is being able to integrate multiple types of commands into a single remote. The same can be said for big competitors like Control 4, for example, but the Control 4 remote being hardware and static doesn't have a lot of configurability. In fact, one of the things that Control 4 struggled to do in my setup was just to activate the built-in Netflix application running on my TV. Instead, most Control 4 users have to utilize an external third-party uh, streaming service viewer, such as an Apple TV, that they have a good integration with. Uh, Control 4 does have a good integration with Apple TV. However, not all users have those, and not all installations require one. Instead, we also have the Apple Remote, as you're familiar with those. Pretty simple device. And there's basically two ways we can approach this remote. We can either start with the device elements where we're doing some of the backend work involving uh, creating the devices, the controls, communicating with those devices, etc. Or if you're like me and you like instant gratification, then you're going to want to start with the UI elements of the remote. Things you can see, download to your phone, and play around with so that you can figure out what is and is not going to work. Maybe you've got a button on the left you need on the right, or maybe you're missing a button entirely that you now need to rework your UI to make room for. So in this example, I've brought up a Excel document. I'll show that now. And this is what our remote in general is going to look like. We've got a series of buttons at the top. We've got our up, down, left, right, enter button series in the middle, which is the same thing that's on the receiver remote as well as the TV remote. And is also present on our Apple TV remote for later. And then we've got a volume slider and a mute down here at the bottom. Okay, we're ready to start the project for this video. We're gonna start up here in the designer with file, new, platform, we're gonna switch it to iOS, and then we're gonna get rid of this message at the beginning. This center portion here, where it displays the remote visually, like you would see it on the remote, is actually part of the simulator. If we wanna click start in the top left, the program will execute exactly as it would if we had loaded it on our device. This is extremely handy for doing testing, and this is how I will be displaying all of our further tests without needing to switch to a physical device. I'll stop the simulator now. Before we begin, we'll first bypass the built-in navigational elements as we did in the first video. We'll start on the main page by double-clicking on the main page.saml, bringing up the navigational element. We'll change the is groups visible option to false, and then we'll create our menu item. This time, when I'm creating the menu item, I'm going to go ahead and name it home. And with the new page, I will also name home.xaml. Now, when the remote boots up for the first time, it'll immediately visit the home.xaml page. Double-clicking on that will bring up the outline for that page. And here on the right-hand side, you can see that the default element is the content page itself. These settings in here will control this page itself. Below, you can see we've already been given one grid element. And within that grid element, we are going to create a child grid. That child grid will be con constrained by the parent grid that is currently selected. To create our child grid, we're going to go to Controls, and then under Layout, select Grid, and then click and drag to complete our grid. Let's take a moment to talk about the parent-child relationship going on in the outline. The grid we just created, this child grid element, is actually a child of the parent grid element above it. If we were to minimize the elements within inside the parent grid, the child grid would also be minimized. This means if we delete this parent grid, all of its children or any other controls therein would also be deleted or modified. Grid controls are really just containers comprised of rows and columns, much like an Excel spreadsheet. In our case, if we look at our example, what we're really trying to create at the basic level is three containers, one at the top, one in the middle, and one at the bottom of our remote. To accomplish this, we'll need three rows. To create them, we'll go over to Row Definitions and click the ellipses. In this collection editor, we'll add one, two, three rows, and if I move the window out of the way, you'll see that those have been created on the page. 
Now, I know that I want this bottom row to be significantly smaller than these top two rows. To accomplish this, I could do so in many different ways. One of the simplest ways is just simply to take this asterisk here, which effectively means that they are multiples of each other. You'll see that row, rows one, two, and three all have asterisks. And if I just change this to a 0.5 on row three, and I'm going to press tab to confirm that change. Now, when messing with grids, a lot of times the visual element will not, will not change while the collection editor is open. To see my modification here, I'm going to close the collection editor and click off of this grid that I'm modifying and then back on. Now you can see the change reflected. See how that bottom grid is now smaller than the top two, or I'm sorry, the bottom row is now smaller than the top two rows. So now you can see in our current grid that it's just kind of hanging out here in the middle. And that's because it's been created exactly where I drew it when I had the layout tool selected. To get rid of this extra space surrounding this grid element, I need to clear out these margins. I can either manually type in the same format worth of zeros or just simply delete the line, but instead I'm going to opt over here for a left click on this black icon square and select reset to default. Again, this is really handy to clear out anything that the element is not on a default value for. Here you can see another example where horizontal alignment has been changed to stretch. Now if I reset this one to default, you'll see that it stayed at stretch. That's because stretch is its default value. Now you can see that the grid element is now taking up the entire screen. And this is a great segue to talk about screen size. Now because I'm going to be running this remote on multiple resolutions and potentially multiple aspect ratios, I need to make sure that my remote is built in a way to automatically resize itself to fit any screen. Now there are a few caveats here and there where you may need to specifically call out a dimension or in other words, discreetly identify a dimension by typing in a specific value. However, in my experience, I've found it's almost always better to try to create your remote from the very beginning in a way that can easily scale to fit any phone or any dimensions. This is typically using stretch or uniform stretch options where applicable. Now that we have the backbone of the remote created, we're now just going to create another grid within this first grid cell. So now again on the outline, you can see I have a child of a child of a child of the parent. A bit of an insurrection here. So again, the first step I'm going to do is get rid of these margins here so that my new child grid is taking up one entire space of this grid. Next, according to my diagram here, I'm going to need one, two, three rows and one, two, three, four columns. I'll create those now. Because I haven't changed the size of any of those column or row definitions, they're all going to try to equal each other out so that each row has an equal portion of the available space and the same is true for the columns. All right, so we've got our first grid done and it's time to move on to the second down below. If we look back at our example that we're trying to replicate, we've only got three rows and three columns worth of information. However, I could go ahead and create those as is, but I already know that there's a UI issue coming my way. And that is because if you compare the width of the same elements on my Visio remote, up, down, left, right, center, and the width of my phone, the two are incredibly different. In fact, the elements on the remote are about half the width of my phone. That means that the same buttons are going to be very large on my phone and in fact difficult to navigate. If I see, if you see I try to move my thumb all the way over to that left side of my screen, it's pretty difficult to do. I can only get about two thirds of the way there comfortably. That means that I need to create some extra space on the left and right hand sides of this grid to help narrow in those buttons. Now I could do that a variety of ways. The most common way would probably be to use the margins. Instead, what I'm going to opt for is to create a couple of extra columns. Specifically, I'm going to create one extra column on the right and one extra column on the left and then just never use those. So I'll show you how that's done. I'm going to start dragging a new grid, but I'm going to show you a mistake first. I've started to drag my new grid, but as you can see, when I started to click and drag, I started within the parent grid above it. That means my new new grid is now yet another child element here, when really I wanted it to be up here. I wanted it to be a parent, or I'm sorry, a child 
of this grid. To complete this change, all I need to do is Control Z to undo that. And this time when I start drawing my grid, I'm going to make sure that I start drawing it down here in the portion that I want. Now you can see that both of these grids are children of this parent grid. This is an important concept to note. The next step is to get rid of these margins as I've done before, so that I'm now taking up all available space. And this time, as I mentioned, I'm going to create five columns and just three rows. Now you can see that this center cross section here is actually going to be where my up, left, down, right, enter buttons are going to be. The left and right columns will be left blank. Okay, the last grid we need to work on is this section down below. In the volume control section, we're going to have two things right now, just a volume slider as well as a mute button. The slider does need to be pretty large in width as to be able to control a large number of variables. We also just need a small button over here for on the right for a mute. I'm going to start drawing that grid down here in the bottom. First step is to remove the margins and you can see it also for some reason gave me a discrete height value this time. I'll get rid of that as well by resetting the height to default. Next I'll create my one row which isn't really necessary since there's only one row there anyway and it's always going to give us one by default. However I'll also create my two columns at this time and this time at the first column I'm going to have this as a width four times larger than the one times column after it. I'll just click off the grid and click back on to show you what that looks like. Looks like my vertical alignment here is throwing me off as you can't even really see the grid right now other than these uh, placeholder elements here. All I need to do is reset that to default and now you can see that I've got my full height grid. So there you have it. We have our initial three grids for this project all sitting within a parent grid which is creating kind of the basic outline and then we have even one more parent grid which is actually just there kind of for us in reserve in case we ever need it. I always like to leave this default parent grid available just in case I need it later on down the road so I don't have to go changing everything around to accommodate more things. So it's a little bit difficult to see what we've actually done at this point. However, if I click on each grid, you'll be able to see the space and elements we've created for these various controls that we'll be putting on in the next videos. The grid layout tool is by far my favorite. I use it all the time in all types of pages and all scenarios. I love the fact that you can nest them together using uh, column and row spanning options and just basically doing anything and everything with them and keeping the design really clean. However, there also are some other layout options. I use stack panels occasionally, usually just to butt up uh, concatenate text variables together. And I've actually never used a wrap panel or canvas before and the scroll viewer is new to me as well. So you're going to be using grids a lot, especially if you're following along with my videos. If you are looking for inspiration on your own remote layout, then look no further than the physical device that came with your remote. That's what I do most of the times, is I just copy whatever the manufacturers use and transpose those layouts onto my own remote design. Then I might go through and eliminate sections or add sections as necessary. That's all for this time. During the next video, we'll start actually adding clickable elements and utilize the built-in simulator on our remote. We'll see you in the next one.